Welcome to the Biblical Bonitarian channel. My name is Mario, and this is the third part of a multi-part video series in which I am reviewing a debate that we have on the channel from the Gospel of John chapters 14 through 17 that we conducted last year with Brother Martin. In the first few videos, I was essentially laying the foundation of the discussion that we'll be having as part of this debate. And in the second part, I actually started to discuss the whole concept of what is the helper and the parakletos. And in this video, we'll actually be making the case as Bonitarians, we believe that the father is the parakletos, the helper, uh, the figurative helper uh, for the disciples as the Lord is returning to uh, his side. As always, we offer a disclaimer that biblical bonitarianism is unorthodox and non credal and you should exercise discernment as you listen to the things on this channel. I want to just jump right in on the heels of our discussion last time. Last time, I think we very clearly explained how the parakletos was used in Greco-Roman world as well as in the Jewish world. We see the verbal aspects of it that are used throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. And in particular, we see this verbal adjective that the Lord Jesus Christ was using was not a proper name, but a functional role that people actually filled in real life circumstances. So in this video, we're making the claim as Bonitarians that when the Lord Jesus Christ said, I will ask the Father to give you another helper, that he was actually referring to the Father and that the Father is that another helper that will be given to the disciples and hopefully to you as well if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Let's get into the, the, the text here. So last time around, I read John, John chapter 14. But what I want to do here is I actually want to take a step back and just give you the lay of the land in terms of our arguments. Let me just bring this up uh, first, the actual slides, and then we'll step into this text. So we began last time, I showed you these slides that allow us to have a frame of reference as we go through. So let me just bring this up again. Okay, okay. And in these slides, I said this is the key slide. It shows the five questions that we're seeking to answer as part of our, uh, as part of the debate from the Bonitarian presentation. And it also shows the answers that we give to each one. Now, these are the answers that we started out with on the first two points. And we were focusing on this second point, which we're going to continue on today. What or who is the helper, the parakletos? And our answer is, the Father is the figurative parakletos, and the Spirit of Truth is his very own spirit. And we're going to actually get into text to support the first part of that, that the Father is the figurative parakletos. And the next videos, um, video number four and five, we'll actually start talking about the Spirit of Truth, what that is, and how the Father is the Spirit of Truth. It's his very own spirit. So in this statement, you have the figurative, which is parakletos, and you also have the literal, which is Spirit of Truth that the Lord uses repeatedly to undergird what he means by the parakletos. And we'll talk about that in the following videos. But for today, let's focus upon the Father. What I would like to do at the outset here, as we look at this text, is to give you just a few arguments of why we believe that the Father is the parakletos. I will um, start off, I'm going to give you about six, six main arguments, and I'll play some of the clips as we go. Uh, some of these I'll just cite from the clips. If you want to hear the original debate, it's in the description, and you can actually go back and listen to those sections. But I want to just give you those six arguments of why we believe that the Father is a parakletos. These Some of these include some arguments that I did not make during the debate, but I feel that they, they accentuate the, the overall argument, so I want to include them now. The first argument really is this. We, we, we establish from John chapter 16 that the Lord has been speaking figuratively about the Father. And we'll go to that passage, that verse in John 16, verse 25, and I'll play the clip where you actually hear me explain it. But that, to me, is a powerful statement. We'll, you'll hear my explanation in the debate, but 
the first thing to establish when anyone you know reacts to you saying that the father is the figurative helper, the parakletas, is to then go to John 16, 25. Because when we say figurative, what we begin to understand is what the Lord himself is saying. And you'll hear my explanation of that. The second argument that we need to have firmly in our minds is that in this very passage, John chapter 14, which we start with, the Lord himself has been repeatedly describing the Father as the one who is in him, right? And that's important because it's not just that we jump into verse 15 and we jump in the middle of the context. We need to take it from the top where the Lord in chapter 14, beginning at verse 1, is talking very uh, directly about him and the Father repeatedly. In fact, all the verses up to, to this uh, verse 15, he's talking about himself and the Father, and he's actually repeating that's the Father who is in him, and he's in the Father, and the Father is the one who's dwelling in him. We're going to go through those verses so you can hear the context. The third argument, which I won't go into as much detail on this particular video, but it comes at a later one, really, in our opinion, is the, is the you know, the, the fate of complete. Immediately after promising to give them the helper, the spirit of truth, which he clearly says, he then explains how he and the father will dwell in the disciples. And that's in John chapter 14, verses 18 to 24. He gives about three to four statements that pretty much reiterate that point. And it's the exact same pattern as we have in John 15 and, and, and verse to verse 17. And it follows right on the heel. It's the immediate Versus following that promise. In our opinion, it is the Lord Jesus's statement of clarification regarding that. So that's number three. We won't get into that in this video. That'll come. That's so important. It'll be its own video that we'll discuss that. The fourth one is John chapter 17. Many people forget John chapter 17. It is an amazing chapter. The Lord is praying directly to the Father, and He is praying everything that He's promised. And he asked the father to perform the actions of a helper, a parakletos to the disciples. And we'll go through that. Fifthly, what I should do is I'll go and I'll show you some other passages in, in the gospel where we have the Lord Jesus Christ himself actually showing that it's always been the Father within him. The Lord Jesus Christ is not only the means, he's also the model. And we see very clearly that this is how he taught, that he has the gift of the Spirit within him. He's the anointed one. He has the anointing. And he speaks of the Father being in him and the Father being the one who's teaching him. And that's what he's promising to his disciples. And then seventhly, just as an added bonus, I'm going to take you to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, where even though it's not in the Gospel of John, but it's another parallel passage where the Apostle Paul actually also calls the Father the Comforter, right? He doesn't use the word Comforter, but he uses the verbal form of that word. In fact, he uses it more times in that section than anyone else does in the Bible. And it's so powerful because it's very clearly he's talking about the Father and he calls him the God of all comfort. So those six arguments, we're going to make the case that the Father is the Comforter. Let's get through them. Um, so first up, I'll play the clip where I actually say about John chapter 16, verse 25, that Jesus tells us that he's been speaking in this section, that's 14, 15, and 16, about the Father. Okay, let me just uh, play that. What are who is the parakletos? This is going to require a little bit more time. We're saying as Bonitarian, the father is the figurative parakletos, and the spirit of truth is his very own spirit. We're going to look at different passages to establish this. So as we go through, I want you to pay close attention, okay? What I want to do first as we go through this is and I'll try to do it in a summary way. I want to say this. If the word is being used figuratively, then I have the burden of proof of saying that Jesus is speaking figuratively of the Father. So what I have you turn is John 16, verse 25, which is the end of this upper room discourse. 
where Jesus, after he just finished making the last statements about the parakletos, Jesus in chapter 16, verse 25, and there's a lot that I would like to discuss prior to this, but I'll focus right on this. He starts talking about these things, plural. And notice what he says in verse 25 of chapter 16. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. Now, we know what figures of speech are, right? They're not the literal explanations of the realities. They're symbolic or they're visual representations of the reality. And sometimes they're, they're allegorical, okay? But here Jesus said, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. This comes at the end where the disciples are questioning, like, hey, how do we understand what he's saying? Then he says next, notice the next sentence. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. Now, you may say, okay, he's clearly saying prior to this statement, He's been speaking in figures of speech. That's more than one. Figures of speech. But he's saying the hour is coming when I will tell you plainly. Now, I want to show you the contrast. I've been speaking to you in figures of speech, but that's the adversative. The hour is coming when I will tell you plainly or speak to you plainly about the Father. That sentence won't make sense. It doesn't have any clear logic if Jesus does not mean that he's been speaking figuratively about the Father in some of the preceding passages. And what my point is, he could have said anything at that point. I've been speaking to you in figures of speech. The day is coming when I will tell you plainly about the Trinity, plainly about the revelation of the new person, the new third person, the Holy Spirit. He could have said that, but he doesn't say that. Okay, uh, not much to add there. I won't. Uh, <laughs> I won't elaborate further. I think that's spot on. It's a strong argument, and if you if you really read, and this is why it's important to read the entire context. If you're reading John 14, 15, and sixteen, if the Lord ends that section. And the disciples still are trying to figure him out. And he says, I've spoken these things to you in figures of speech. The day is coming where I'll tell you plainly about the Father. And you go back and say, well, what you should automatically ask, well, what figures of speech has he spoken about? When you go backwards over those sections, he actually says these things. You see that there's really, in fact, there's only a few figures of speech that he uses. He, he uses the figures of speech of the vine dresser for the Father. So that's definite in chapter 15. But he doesn't use, there, there are no other figures of speech that he uses of the Father uh, that are applicable to the Father other than parakletos. And we're going to argue that he's not speaking of himself um, as the you know, definitive parakletos. He first begins with the Father. Now, he will be included in this gift, when we, especially when we talk about the next video, the Spirit of Truth. But he's first giving them what he has. And that is, that in my opinion, is where you have to start, is that the Lord Jesus Christ says, I've been speaking to you in figurative speech, and it's plural, about the Father. The day will come where I'll tell you plainly. Once you understand that this is figurative language, that changes the entire debate, that changes the entire discussion. The second thing that we have to do is we have to look at this larger context of John chapter 14. Now, obviously, Jesus makes fourfold statements in chapter two and four, chapter 14, one and 15, and uh, one in chapter 16. But chapter 14 is where this is introduced to them in this moment of impending sorrow and suffering. And what I just want to do, just really, <laughs> once you see it, you can't unsee it. Uh, I just want to just show you the, the text in John chapter 14. And I want to begin with John chapter 14, verse one, very familiar passage. And once again, it shows you the power of context. Now, notice how often he talks about the Father and what he says about the Father. And let's just kind of follow through. John chapter 14, reading from the ESV, it says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, 
what I've told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. There's enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Now, notice how many times he actually talks about the Father being in him in this next few verses. He says in verse 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? That's one. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. That's two. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. That's three. Or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And then he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth. Now, what, what I want to just pause here and just explain to you is when you hear this in this context, it, it now makes more sense while we're saying the gift that he's giving them, that he's promising to give them is the father. He's promising to give them what he himself has, which is the father who is in me, in me, in me. He dwells in me. Now, he also says that I am in the father, which we, we as Bonitarians will also make sure we clarify that point because that's profound that you have both the Father and the Son when he gives you the one gift of the Spirit. That's for a later video. But in this video, the preeminent one that is in focus is that Jesus is saying, I'm doing what I do because the Father is in me. Don't you believe it? And I've shown you the Father because he is in me and you now see me working what I'm working so powerfully that you can say you've seen the Father and you've known the Father. And now it becomes powerful that we say, now he's going to ask the Father for another helper to replace himself who's with the disciples. What is that another helper? I'm going to ask the Father to give you the spirit of truth. And when he gives you the spirit of truth, you also will have the Father. So that chapter 14 is powerful. Uh, up to that uh, verse uh, 14, verses 1 through 14. Thirdly, I made the point that when you get to chapter 14 verses 18 to 24, which I won't read now. We'll save that for another video. He pretty much explicitly says it. It'll be the father in me and me in you, right? And, you know, he, he repeats that in multiple ways. And so you have the father and I dwelling with you. We'll deal with that in another verse. The other thing that I want to just bring out is we have in the, in the gospel of John repeatedly, the Lord Jesus Christ giving us the model. We make statements like this. We say that the father is both giver and gift. He is the one who gives his spirit and his spirit, his very own spirit is what he gives. If a Trinitarian says that another helper has to be someone other than the father, what they're essentially saying is that the father cannot be both giver and gift. He cannot be the one who gives of his own spirit. And that's the dynamic of spirit. We're talking about God giving out of his own spirit. We'll, we'll definitely talk about that in the next upcoming videos when we go to 1 John chapter 4. But what we want to say here is God is the giver and gift, but the son is both the model and the means. He's the example of what this looks like. Jesus Christ has the spirit of God in him. I don't think anyone will disagree. In fact, that's what it means to be the Christ, the anointed. 
So he's the model of someone who has received the spirit of God. We see this in John chapter one, where John actually said, this is how I know who it was, you know, who is going to be the Messiah, the one on whom you see the spirit descend and remain. He it is who baptizes with the spirit of truth, right? That's profound. Jesus receives the spirit, but he also gives the spirit. He's the model and the means. And sometimes I'll say it, he's the anointed and the anointer. He's the anointed one. That's what Christ means. And he is the one who anoints his people. What is he anointing them with? He's anointing them with the very spirit of God, which is also within him. So if he's the model, how should he talk? Well, this is where, as I said, the best passages to teach the Trinity become the biggest passages, our biggest problems for the Trinity. If Jesus is the model, then the question is, does he have a helper? Does he have a parakletos? And the answer to that question is yes. He's received the gift of the spirit. So he has the parakletos, the helper. And the answer is, and who does he repeatedly say throughout the gospel of John that helper is? And it's hands down. It's the father. John chapter 10, John chapter 5, John chapter 8, John chapter 14, as he just said in the preceding verses, he says, it's the Father in me. He does the works. He does the works. Now, he says, you're going to do greater works. How is that? You also are going to have the same helper that I have, the Father. And when you say it, it just it sounds so straightforward that we have to say, that's it. But ask Jesus, who is your helper? He had the gift of the Spirit. The spirit of truth was in him, but he always says it's the father. In fact, he's going to say later on, he says, when you disciples leave me, I'm not alone for the father is with me. Chapter 17, which I'll bring in some of these points here. But what's interesting is that the that there you know, what, what's interesting, my famous line is in chapter 17, he actually prays for what he promises. I won't go through all of it here, but he actually prays to the Father singularly, you, Father, glorify me with the glory I have with you, singular. And then he asked the Father to take care of his disciples. He says, I've been with them. I've kept them. And that's really what this is all about. Who does Jesus ask to be with the disciples and keep them when he's going to the Father? He says, I'm returning to you, Father. And I won't go through this passage, but he repeatedly, he asked the Father to sanctify them. He asked the Father to unify them. He asked the Father to fortify them, protect them from the evil one, from the world, to keep them, to keep them. And he even asked the Father to edify them, to teach them the truth. His word is true. He's asking the Father to do the work of a helper. That's what a parakletos is, someone who is with you, someone who keeps you. And the father had done it for him. And now he's asking the father to do it for his disciples. That's why he can say, I've spoken these things to you in figures of speech. But the day is coming where I will tell you plainly about the father. In fact, in John chapter 17, I wish I could go through the entire chapter with you verse by verse. Let me just read a few verses um, from uh, John chapter 17. There's so much here. uh, But I'm going to read verses 20 down to verse 26 ESV. And it says, of John chapter 17, verse 20 to 26. I do not ask for those only, that's his disciples, but I also ask for those who will believe in me through their word. Hopefully that's you. I know that's me. It keeps going. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Notice that. That, that, that's as simple as day. That's as plain as day. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one, even as we are one. I, and this verse 23 is powerful. I in them and you in me, that we may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. Oh, righteous father, even though the world does not know you, that's one of the hallmarks of the uh, parakletos, I know you and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them 
and I in them. Now, there's so much here, but the Lord can't say it any more clearly. And when we get to John 14, verses 18 to 24, he's pretty much going to say it's you and me and, and the father and me and the father and I in the disciples. That's the gift of the parakletos. And, and that's a greater gift. You, if, if you think about it, he's giving you what he had, that he's just not just standing there with them as he was in, in this particular passage. He would have the father in them and that he would be in the father and the two of them would be in the disciples. That's powerful. Let me just continue. Uh, not only John chapter 17, now we see Jesus as the model and the means. Here's a passage that I didn't have a chance to talk about during the debate. It's from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm actually going to bring this up on the screen. The Apostle Paul here uses the uses the uh, the, the the verbal form of the word parakletos um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And he uses it more times than any place I can find in the Bible. And it is, it's phenomenal when you see how, how, how it uses it. And many of you are familiar with this passage. So it's a wonderful passage, aren't they all? But this one has hopefully uh, been used to comfort you uh, in different situations. Let me bring it up on the screen and just show you, show you this passage, okay? So, I'll jump right down and actually in the ESV, it actually sections it off. It says the God of all comfort. OK. And it says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we know who that is. That's the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is definitely the father. Right. Hopefully that you know does not require much uh, substantiation. Then he adds, he calls him the father of mercies and God of all comfort. So just pause. He's talking about the father. He's not a third person. And he calls the father, the father of mercies and the God of all comfort. That word there is the verbal form of the word parakletos. It is the God of all um, helping, right? If you want to use that word helper, right? He's the God of all comforting or helping. And notice how many times he uses that word. It's the exact same related words, the verbal form of that word. But he says, who comforts us in all of our affliction, in all our affliction, Putin. And notice that's, that's comprehensive. That's not just a, a subset of our afflictions, in all our afflictions, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction, right? With the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. Once again, that's the, that's the Father. So the Father is comforting them in all their afflictions that they may be able to comfort others in all their afflictions with the comfort that we receive from God as we've been comforted by God. Now, Paul is, if you think I use uh, certain words many times, notice how many times Paul is saying this. He doesn't stop. He keeps going. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Notice, Christ is the means for us getting this comfort. He keeps going. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that, you, that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Now, he uses that word so many times in that passage. That's intentional. That's deliberate. And in particular, he's saying that it's the Father. God the Father there is the one who is doing that comfort. He is that role. So let's just pause. Trinitarians have to acknowledge that Jesus had a helper. He says in the Gospel of John, in that chapter 14, as we saw from verses 1 through 14, as well as the entirety of the Gospel of John, that it's the Father. He's the one enemy. He does the works. He speaks the words. He is with me. He has not left me alone. And he says that throughout the Gospel of John. We see in John 17 that Jesus prays to the Father and asks him to do these type of things that Paul is, is calling on. And keep, you know, to, to, to unify, to sanctify, to fortify, to edify the disciples in his name. And he even says explicitly, Father, that you may be in me and I may be in them, that we may be in them and that they may be one, even as we are one. Then we see Paul here give his own example, apart from John, in his own writings, 
in saying to the Corinthians in many terms, in many ways, that it's the Father who is the God of all comfort, who comforts him in all of his affliction for the sake of others being comforted through Jesus Christ. We can make many arguments, but what I want to show you here is that this is really the, the crux of our case, is that whether it be in the Gospel of John or in the book like Second Corinthians here, that there is the Father can take this role. If you don't believe it, right here, Second Corinthians chapter 1, Paul is saying that the Father can take that role and is doing that role. In fact, he's the God of all comfort. What I'll do now is I want to just I want to show you a um, show you a uh, a slide that really brings us home about the father being the the uh, the helper. And I want to just bring up this chart. I shared this chart in the debate and I'm going to share it for you now on the screen so that you're able to see it. OK, and so when you go through this, what I did is I took. From these chapters, John chapter 14, 15, and 17, obviously we don't have time to go through every verse, so I did it in a chart form so you could see it, and now you can see it more clearly. And what I did is I did seven attributes about the helper that I mentioned in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, and then I took seven actions. So attributes, these are qualities, properties that are mentioned in Jesus as he's talking about the helper, and then these are seven actions that he mentioned. So seven and seven, and I've done this now for um, you know almost 19 years, and I have not been able to find any others. So I think if anything, some of these overlap, but seven actions, seven attributes, when Jesus describes the helper in this chapter of John chapter 14 through 16. And what I did is I actually went back and throughout John, mostly throughout John, put a few other verses uh, from some other books, but mostly throughout John, I just show verses where it describes the father as the one who does that particular action or who has that particular attribute. Uh, one, I'll, I'll give you some examples here. For example, Jesus says uh, in this third list of actions here that that one, he will teach you all things and bring them to your remembrance, my teachings, right? That's in John 14, 26. What's amazing is when you go earlier in John, before you get to John chapter 14, the Lord Jesus Christ says that that's the father who does that work. John chapter six is a famous chapter where Jesus says, no one comes to me unless the father draws him. And he actually says that, you know, all those who will learn of God will come to me. And he actually quotes a passage from Nehemiah. And we see it's very similarly in chapter 12, 49 to 50, he makes the same assertion that all those who are taught of God will come to him and that you will learn from God. God has been the one who's been teaching. In fact, no one, no one can come to Jesus unless the father draws them. He's the one who teaches you. He's the one that instructs you. It's the same word for teach. Um, there, there's others where, like, for example, the Lord talks about witnessing. He says, he, that one, will bear witness about me in chapter 15, verse 26. Same word for witness is used in chapter 8, verses 17 through 18, where Jesus says, your law says that out of the testimony of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. I am one who bears witness, and my father is another. And what's interesting, he doesn't name a third. In fact, you don't have a case where Jesus does three of anything and says these three, we, are something of that nature. He actually says it's the Father who bears witness. He also says that in chapter 5, verse 37. Um, there are other passages I could go to and show you similarly on the, the attribute side. I mentioned a number of those in the debate. The world cannot see it. The world does not know it. Uh, and he says those things about the Father. What's profound about this list is this is it. This, these are the attributes and the actions that describe the parakletos. And what I'm showing you, not only what I said precedingly, that the father, you know, is the parakletos, the helper for the son, and that in this very passage, Jesus talks about how the father is with him and he, he's in the father, and we see that he prays to the father. But we also see here that everything that you would expect to be descriptive of the helper, the father fulfills that. In Jesus, and we see it in the, in the in these passages. Now, what this immediately does is Jesus immediately explains to us that it's going to be the gift of the Spirit that's going to fulfill this. And in this passage, in fact, in all of the passages where he mentions the parakletos, the helper, he immediately follows it with the Spirit of Truth. Spirit of Truth is his explanatory expression for helper. If helper is figurative, parakletos is figurative, Spirit of Truth is literal. 
And every time he mentions it, he either says spirit of truth. And I think once in chapter 14, verse 25 to 26, he actually uses the expression Holy Spirit, which is synonymous with spirit of truth. And he does that for those passages. And in the next video, we're actually going to be exploring what it means, the spirit of truth and had God a spirit and how can the father give us his own spirit? And that's giving us the spirit of truth. And we'll see how the spirit is both what and who God is and in the subsequent videos. But I think this at least should clarify to you why we claim that the father is the helper, the parakletos, and the blessing of having him be in us and in the son and in us at the same time. Hopefully this has been helpful. And I'm hoping that you, uh, in addition to liking this video, that you also subscribe and share and that you remember us in your prayers. We'll come back with the next video on the spirit of truth. Thanks for watching.